week in a sermon series titled Pentecostal People. I'm so grateful for Pastor Dylan kicking off the sermon series last Sunday with our first message, Pentecostal people are Christ-centered. Pentecostal people are Christ-centered. Jesus is always our focus. Amen? We don't want to get our eyes off of Jesus. Sometimes as Pentecostal people, we get so excited about all the other things that are in the Bible. Does the Bible talk about physical healing? Yeah. And as Pentecostal people, we believe in physical healing. Does the Bible talk about the gifts of the Holy Spirit and and miracles and uh, amazing things like prophecy that can take place in our midst? Does the Bible talk about that? Yes, it does. But sometimes we get so excited about that that our focus becomes prophecy or becomes a move of the Holy Spirit or becomes some kind of manifestation of God's power and presence that we leave Jesus behind. Listen, we are always going to be Christ-centered first. Amen? And all those other good things follow when we seek Jesus first. And so we're going to be Christ-centered. The second thing I want to tell you today is as Pentecostal people, we are Bible-based. We believe the Bible and we live by God's Word. This Bible is our guide for life, for faith, and for doctrine. This is my guide for my life, for my faith, and for my doctrine. What's doctrine? It's all the stuff I believe. You're like, I don't have any doctrines. Doctrines are bad. Listen, Pentecostal people don't believe that doctrine is bad. You have doctrines, you just haven't written them down, and therefore you don't have a doctrinal statement. But you have doctrines whether you like it or not. Um, Your grandpa, who wasn't even saved, probably taught you some unsaved grandpa doctrines. Um, (laughs) There's still doctrine. The, The Bible is my guide for life, for faith, and my doctrine. Man, when I was a young man, um, I met Stephanie. We started dating. A few months later, at the end of a semester of college, she needed to go back to Detroit for the summer because she had a job. Now, get this. Back when minimum wage was $5 an hour, she had a job in Detroit that paid $15 an hour. So go back to Detroit. It is, right? You got to make some money because you got to pay for college. And she paid for all of her college on her own, and she did great and made a lot of money and and made it work out. God provided. But uh, she went back to Detroit. That same summer, um, I joined a quartet that was doing ministry. We'd already been traveling around and singing at some churches, and sometimes the church would have us preach for them. And uh, we determined that we were going to travel all summer and just do ministry. And then uh, we were invited to go to some camps, so we ended up going to nine youth camps that summer from New York all the way to Nebraska. Uh, We did two weeks in Kentucky, Pennsylvania, Delaware, uh, Illinois, just all over. We did nine youth camps, and in between the Monday and Fridays of youth camp, we would travel to some church in between this camp and that camp, and we'd have a service on Sunday morning, we'd drive in the afternoon, and we'd have a service on Sunday night, we'd drive to the next camp in the morning, and we'd start youth camp. I mean, I'm telling you what, that might wear a person out. How many of you know how tired you are on Saturday after youth camp? Yeah? Okay. That was drive day. Sometimes you drive eight hours and get up in the morning and preach and sing, do two services, drive some more, do another service, preach and sing, drive a little bit, find a place to stay or sleep in the van and then keep going. Listen, that was an amazing summer and uh, God blessed Stephanie with great income that summer. And let me just tell you, as a kid who was 19 years old, God blessed me with great income traveling, ministering and preaching at churches. It was God provided, and I'm so grateful for that time. Well, remember, Stephanie and I had just started dating. You can turn the, the gain down just a little bit on this microphone. It'll stop that ringing thing. So we had just started dating, right? And so we're like, we got to communicate through the summer. And we didn't want to use phone cards. You guys remember phone cards? So you have this card, it's like a credit card with all this prepaid time that you can talk to somebody on the phone. And so you have to enter the whole card number, and then you have to enter um, the, the carrier number, which is another 10-digit number, and then you enter the phone number. And if you ever messed any of the numbers up, up you had to start all over again. How many of you remember those days? Those were like the dark days of phone. Um, and so you paid for every minute that you talked. You paid, remember that? And like, if you got a phone card that was five cents a minute, you thought you had like pure gold. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to my, I'm going to talk to my sweetheart for five cents a minute after I enter 15 digits and try not to get any of them wrong on this crazy pay phone, you know. Well, that was a terrible way to communicate. So we determined that we would write each other all summer long. And 
at home in a Rubbermaid with all my keepsakes and all my precious little things that I've saved through my life. In this Rubbermaid, I have a stack about five inches thick of all the letters that Stephanie wrote me that summer. I've saved them all these years. This summer, we celebrated our 30th wedding anniversary, and I still have all of her letters. Yeah, it's so cool. Now, how many of you know that when you have a sweetheart and you get a letter, you really read it? Right? Yeah, you read it over and over and over, and you read between the lines, and you read all the nuances, and you want to understand the context. What was she feeling? What is she really saying? What does she really mean? I mean, you dig into that love letter. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You really read something when it's from your sweetheart, and you keep it because you want to remember it, don't you? Can I tell you something today? We have a word from God that is special, and we need to read it, and we need to read it carefully, and we need to study it, and we need to understand what is being said to us, and we need to receive the love of Almighty God as he speaks to us. And I want to tell you today, we are Bible-based people, and God has given us his word so that we can live by it, so that it can give us guidance for our life and everything that we believe for all of our doctrine. How many of you want that in your life today? Amen. Today I want to talk to you about being Bible-based people. Pentecostal people are Bible-based. Um, what does it mean to be Pentecostal? Well, we're going to discuss that in the next few weeks, but a few years ago when our church was back in the other location, uh, a lady came to our church, and uh, she, I'd never met her before, a uh, young mom. She had a nice dress on, and after church she went to my wife and said, Stephanie, I noticed that not all the women at church are wearing dresses. And Stephanie said, no, they're not. And she's like, this is the only dress I own. And I was kind of worried to come visit church here because I don't have another dress option. This is the only dress I own. And I heard you were Pentecostal and that I would need to wear a dress. Can I tell you something? Being Pentecostal is not dependent on the clothing that you wear. Amen? Being Pentecostal is not determined on the types of songs that you sing. They're about Jesus because they're going to be Christ-centered, and they're going to be biblical because we're Bible-based. But it's not about whether it's a country song or a contemporary song, or it's an old hymn or it's a new chorus. It's not about whether or not the pastor wears a suit and tie or doesn't, or whether the pastor has a southern accent when he preaches or he doesn't, or how many of you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> It, it's not about whether or not the pastor screams and shouts and sweats through his collar. That's not, that is not the definitive uh, uh, mark of what it is to be Pentecostal. Pentecostal has to do with being Christ-centered, being Bible-based, and being spirit-empowered. And what we want to talk to you in this series about is being Pentecostal, being Christ-centered, today Bible-based, and next Sunday I want to talk to you about being spirit-empowered. There's a few other things I want to share with you as well, and I think it's going to bless your life. It's going to help you understand who we are, what we believe, and what we can expect from God. Amen? We are Bible-based people. At Lifestream Church, we love to learn, we love to study, we love to explore God's Word, we love to discuss God's Word. While we're in, a, say, a small group, and I encourage every one of you to be in a small group, they're starting up this fall. When we're in a small group, we study, we discuss things together, we'll talk about life together, we seek God together, we pray together so that we can learn about God, we can serve God better, and in all of that seeking, all of that study, all of that discussion, we are Bible-based. If we come upon a claim of truth that contradicts this word, then it's not truth. If it's, if it's true, it's God's truth. And if it's true, it won't contradict God's word. This is our guide. This is our rule for life, for faith, and what we believe, our doctrine. It's the word of God. You need the word of God in your life. If you're going to serve Jesus, if you're going to know who God is, you're going to need to get to know his word, and you need God's word in your life. In all of our searching, all of our learning, all of our discussing, all of our growing, all of our striving, our first source of authority is not the traditions of our church, and this is the way we've always done it, 
It's not, this is what my friends say is really cool. It's not, that's what the other churches are all doing. Listen, the source of authority is not any of those things. It's the word of God. It's God's word. It's the scriptures. We are Bible-based people. Somebody say amen. amen. Now, I'm going to ask you to stand today, and we're going to read some scriptures together. So stand to your feet, and I want you to read all of these scriptures with me out loud today. We don't always do this, do we? But today, I want you to get this, so we're going to read a bunch of scriptures to kick off the message today, and we're going to read them out loud, because I want you to say them to yourself. I want you to hear yourself reading God's word today. The Bible says this, do not neglect the public reading of scripture. Think about this, for 2,000 years of church history, that instruction has been in the Bible. Do not neglect the public reading of Scripture. Think about the centuries of church history where there were no books, and having a book was rare. How many people had access to God's Word? They needed to listen to it read publicly, didn't they, to get it in their hearts and their minds? And how many times in the course of church history did people possibly not know how to read? But someone did, and someone would publicly read the scripture so we all get it together. Today, we're going to honor that old tradition, and we're going to read some scriptures together. Are you ready? Yeah. 2 Timothy 3.16, it's on the screen, and I want you to read it out loud with me. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Psalm 119, verse 89. Psalm 119, verse 89, your word, Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. Psalm 19, verse 7, I love this verse. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. 2 Peter chapter 1, 20 and 21 says this, Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Psalm 119, verse 9. How can a young person stay on the path of purity by living according to your word? And then Joshua 1, verses 8 through 9. God gives this instruction to Joshua. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous, do not be afraid, do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would add your blessing to the public reading and quotation of your word. These are not just words from any book. These are words from your Holy Spirit as we recognize that holy individuals were moved by the Spirit to write these things down for us today. And we thank you for your word. Let it sink into our hearts and minds today and transform our habits in the future. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Can I tell you something? This Bible, this Bible is written from God to you. How was it written? It was written when God breathed it and he used individuals to write down exactly what he wanted them to write down. There was this inspiration of the Holy Spirit that brought about the correct writing of exactly what God wanted to say for us to have his word today. And I'm telling you today that this Bible is from God to you. It is to you. This is God's word to you. It, is it God's word to mankind and all of humanity? Sure. But I'm telling you, personally, this word is to you. And you need to take it personally. You need to receive God's word, not as something for everybody else. It's something for you. It is to you. Second, I want you to understand this. The Bible is for you. God made it for your good, for 
his purpose in your life for your success. What did he tell Joshua? He said, keep this law in your heart and in your mouth that you'll be able to obey it. And then you'll be prosperous and successful in all you do. Listen, this word is for you. It has been given to you for you. It's a gift for you. When, when Stephanie wrote me one of those letters, did she expect me to take that and read it to the other three guys in the van? No way. It was for me. Did she expect me to read it to my mama? Waste all those precious five cents a minute, phone card minutes, talking to my mom about what she wrote me? No way. It was to me and it was for me. Can I tell you something? God's word, it is to you and it is for you. Now let me tell you one last thing. It's about you. It's about you. It'll tell you about yourself. It'll tell you about what you've done and what you've thought and what you think. And it's about your gifting and it's about your future and it's about your potential and it's about God's plan for you. It's about you. Now, let me tell you something. If God Almighty wrote a book to you, for you, and about you, do you think you ought to read it? If God Almighty wrote a book to you, for you, and about you, you better read it. If I don't read it, I'm, I'm an idiot. <laughs> I mean, am I so arrogant that I don't think I need to write what God sent to me, for me, about me? Am I so arrogant that I won't read what he has given me? Am I so lazy that I wouldn't care what he wrote to me and for me and about me? God Almighty! gave this to me. I'm going to read this thing. I'm going to read every one of his words, and I'm going to read it over and over again. And I'm going to study it, and I'm going to learn from it, and I'm going to learn what he wanted to say to me. I want to know what he wants for me, and I want to know what he thinks about me. I want those things. Now, that sounds pretty selfish, but in the process of all those things, to me, for me, about me, it will cause my life to honor him. And then the attention isn't on me and what I need, what I want, what I desire, but I will ultimately please him because I know what pleases his heart. And I know who he is because he describes himself to us in his word. Listen, Pentecostal people are Bible-based people. We are not emotion-based people. We are not experience-based people. We are not money-based people. We are not music-based people. We are Bible-based people. Somebody say amen. Amen. Now, is music good? Yes. Is money necessary? Yeah. Do our emotions sometimes bring us great joy and thrill? Yes. Are experiences great to have? Yes. But I'm Bible-based before I'm anything else. I'm not tradition-based It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what we did 50 years ago. What matters is what God needs us to do today. And what we need to do today needs to be in line with his word. We are Bible-based people. The Bible is to you. It's for you. It's about you. Don't be so arrogant to think, I don't need it. Don't be so lazy to think, I'll do it later. Let's get God's word in our life. Amen? Amen? He has given you this gift of his word. And it's a beautiful, beautiful gift to you today. So you need God's word in your life, but why? Why do I need God's word in my life? Let me give you four things that the Bible describes that help you understand why you need God's word in your life. Number one, you need God's word in your life because it describes who God is. Some people will say to me, Pastor Paul, I've always known God. No, you haven't. That is not biblical. You have not always known God. You may may have always been a theist who thought, there's a God, and I bet I'd like him. And I think he's good. That's fine. That doesn't mean you know God. Listen, if you want to know God, you're going to need to know his word, and if you know his word, you're going to know about his son. If you know about his son, you're going to put your faith in Jesus, you're going to be saved, your sins are going to be forgiven, and then you're going to know God. And I'm so glad that I can say I know God because of the forgiveness of sins that I have through Jesus Christ and the gospel that's in his word. I'm grateful that I can say I know God, but can I tell you something? I'm still getting to know him better. 
And the version of Paul that you know today is not the version of Paul that you knew a year ago. Because I believe that as I live for him, as I read his word, as I study, as I live it out, I know him better today than I did a year ago. And I know him better today, and I'm walking with him better today than I did a decade ago. And I'm grateful for that. Why is that happening? Because the word of God is living and active. It is sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates between the soul and spirit, joint and marrow. It can, it can discern between the thoughts and intents of the heart. Man, it, the word of God is powerful, and it is living, and it's working in my life. You need to let it work in your life, too. You need the word of God. It describes who God is. What do we know about God from the word? We know that he's eternal. Genesis 1.1 says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. What was there before the heavens and the earth? There was nothing but God. Only God was there. And he has always been. He is eternal. He is from everlasting to everlasting. God revealed himself as eternal to one of the first characters in the Bible, Abraham. And so Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba. That's this little town down in the south desert of Israel. He plants this tree in the desert and he called on the name of the Lord, the eternal God, there in Beersheba where he planted his tree. What did Abraham do? He called on an eternal God because he understood that God was before anything else existed. Genesis chapter 21, verse 33, one of the other, or Deuteronomy 33, 27, one of the other great Old Testament characters is Moses. And Moses said this, the eternal God is your refuge and underneath you are the everlasting arms. The eternal God is our refuge and underneath are the everlasting arms. Man, the Bible describes an eternal God who holds us in his hands, in his arms, in, in arms of strength. Are you with me today, church? He's an eternal God, and he is a God who is good for all of eternity. The second thing we find out about God is he's eternal and he is love. John chapter 4, verse 7 through 10 says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Where does love come from? It comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God. Because God is love. That's a pretty simple statement, isn't it? God is love. And this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that, he might live through, that we might live through him, through his son. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that God loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. God was the one that was offended, not me. I offended God, and God loved me so much, he sent his son Jesus anyway. That's love. Think about it. You offend someone, and their response is to give you a limitless gift. That's love. And that's the love of God to you today. Listen, we serve a God who is eternal and we serve a God who is filled with love. John 3:16 says, "For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son." Next, the Bible tells us that God is holy. God is eternal, God is love, and God is holy. Holy means three things. Number 1, it means that he's separate. All of God existed perfectly before anything in creation existed. There's absolutely nothing anywhere like God. There's absolutely nothing anywhere like God. The, the Latin theological term for how God created everything is ex nihilo. That means out of nothing. So what was, what was there before creation? Nothing except God. I mean, God was all there was. It's hard, like, you can't wrap your mind around nothing, can you? Just try to think of absolute nothing. It's impossible because we always live and we have always existed in something, right? You exist in your body. I exist on this earth. I exist in the atmosphere. I exist on a planet, right? So I've always existed in something. It's hard for me to even conceive of absolute nothing, Theoretically, I get it. Practically, I don't get it. 
But God created everything, absolutely everything, out of nothing, and that makes him separate. So now I want you to think about the whole universe. Imagine that you're so big that you can hold the whole universe like the size of a basketball in your hands. If you could hold the whole universe like a basketball in your hands, you would be bigger than the universe, right? Can I tell you something? God transcends the universe. God is not the universe. God is not the substance of his creation. God is separate from his creation. He's bigger than his creation. He transcends his creation. He's beyond his creation. God is holy. He is completely separate. He's not like you or me. The Bible says that God is not a man that he should lie. So he's not like us. He's different from us because he's God and we're part of his creation. We're people. Amen? God is holy. He is separate. He is something different than anything we've ever encountered or known. Second, he is holy and it means he's unchanging. God is never going to change. Psalm 102.27 says, God, you remain the same. Malachi 3.6 says, the Lord does not change. Hebrews 13.8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The Son of God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. James chapter 1 verse 17 says that with God, there is no shadow of change. There is absolutely no variable in God. God is unchanging. All these scriptures declare that God does not change. God is holy in that he is always the same. Aren't you glad that we serve a God who doesn't change? If you tried to serve a God who changed all the time, you'd think you're doing the right thing, and then you find out he changed his mind, and now you're doing the wrong thing. Well, how am I supposed to know what I'm supposed to do, God, when you're constantly changing his mind, changing your mind? He's not changing his mind because God doesn't change. What if God is loving one day and not loving the next? Can I tell you something? God is always good. God is always loving. God, God is always merciful. God is always gracious. God is always just. God is always true. And think about the best day of your life. Think about the day you met your sweetheart. Think about the day you graduated from high school. What a good day. Think about the day that you started college. You know, you moved into the new dormitory. And it was exciting. It's like a good day. And you're like pumped. Uh, think about like the, the first great job you got. I got the dream job. And it pays well. And you're excited. It was a good day. Think about the day you got married. It was a good day. Man, some dude standing down here. And he sees this beautiful young woman walking in with a fairly ugly middle-aged guy. <laughs> Come on, some of you guys are that guy already. And you're just like, this is the best day of my life. You're like, you know what I'm talking about? It, 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 that's a good day. Think about the day when your first kid was born. That's a good day, wasn't it? And you're excited and you're thrilled. Think about the day you bought your first house. That's a good day. Man, you're moving in. And man, whenever I bought a house uh, in the course of my lifetime, I pick up my wife and I kick that door open. And I carry her over the threshold. How many of you have that tradition? Anybody? Okay, I'm all alone on that one. But man, those are good days, right? Can I, now listen to me. God is as good on the day you get fired from the dream job as he was on the day you got hired. God is as good on the day that baby was born as he, as he is on the day that baby died. God is as loving as he was the day you met your sweetheart as he was on the day your sweetheart went home to be with him in heaven. Let me tell you something. God doesn't change. And if he's good, he's always good. And if he's loving, he's always loving. And if he's merciful, he's always merciful. If he's just, he's always just. And sometimes we need to know what the Bible says about God because our experiences are screaming at us that he's not good, he's not loving, he's not fair, he's not kind, he's not merciful, he doesn't pay attention to you. I need the word of God when things aren't going the way I need them to go to feel good. I need the word of God to remind me that God is good and that God is love and that God does not change because he's holy. Is everybody with me today? He's holy and it means he's perfect. So. Because he's holy, he's separate. He's not like anything we've ever known before, so we need to study him. Because he's holy, he's unchanging, and he's trustworthy. And because he's holy, he's perfect. Think about this. 
the perfection of God. 2 Corinthians 7 says, Since we have all these promises, dear friends, let's purify ourselves from everything that contaminates the body and the spirit, perfecting holiness in reverence for God. I want to perfect my holiness in reverence for God. How do I do that? I learn about God. I learn about his holiness. I learn about his perfection in his word. I learn who he is and what his nature is like from the scriptures. And then I begin to emulate that because his Holy Spirit is helping me to be more like him and transform my character and my thinking to be a little more perfect like God is perfect. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 48, Jesus said, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. It's a command of God that you and I must strive for perfection. Am I perfect every day? No. But I'm telling you what, every now and then, every now and then I'll have a day where I can lay my head on the pillow at the end of the day, and I'll look back over the day and I'll say, Lord, Today was as close to perfect in holiness as I can imagine. I can't think of one second where you said no to me. I can't think of one second where I said no to you. That's a good day. Tomorrow I'm going to wake up and I need you to help me have another one to the best of my ability with the help of your Holy Spirit. The Bible says we're to strive for perfection, and we serve a God who is holy and he's perfect. And because he's perfect, he'll never get better than he is today, and he'll never be worse. And that's why he never changes. We serve a holy God. The Bible describes who God is. Number two, why do we need the word of God in our life? Because the Bible describes our origins. Did I tell you that the Bible is to you and for you and about you? It's about you. The Bible describes our origins. The Bible describes the origin of the universe. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The Bible describes the origin of humanity. Listen to this. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 7, the Bible says that God spoke all the stuff of creation into existence. He said, let there be light, and there was light. He said, let the the, the oceans teem with fish, and there were fish. Let there be animals on the land, and there was animals on the land. Let there be plants that grow up from the ground, and plants grew up from the ground. He spoke, and all these things happened. But then in Genesis chapter 3, verse 7, the Bible says that God took some of the dust of the earth with his hands and he formed the dust into a human being and then very intimately God God went to that human being that he formed and with his own mouth he breathed the breath of life into that human being and God made human beings living beings with a soul and a spirit that's different than the rest of creation God created you in love and the Bible tells us the origin of of humanity. In Psalm 8, verses 3 through 5, God said that he made humanity. And the psalmist says, God, what am I? What is mankind? What is a human being that you would be mindful of him? What is a son of man that you would care for him? What, who am I, God, that you put so much care and concern upon me? You've created me a little lower than the angels, yet you've crowned me with splendor. You've created man a little lower than the angels, but you've crowned him with splendor. Can I tell you something? God created you, and he's given you a special kind of splendor as a human being. The Bible tells us about our origins. It tells us how much God cares for us in the way that he made us, and he chose to make you. The Bible also describes the origin of pain and suffering. Well, if God made me with such love and such care, then why is my life filled with so much pain? Whether it's sickness pain, grief pain, financial pain, family pain, relationship pain, why can there be so much pain in the world if God made things so wonderful and so good and if he crowned me with splendor? Why is the world filled with pain? Because in Genesis chapter 3, the Bible tells us that the first man and the first woman decided not to trust God and not to trust his word. And listen, we do the same thing. Temptation went like this. The tempter said to the man and woman, did God really say? The first question was, will you doubt God's word? Did God really say that you should not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? They're like, yep, that's what he said. We know God's word. We know the command. We know his will. We know his plan. He said not to do that. And so then the tempter asked them another question. Well, God said that because He knows that if you eat it, you'll be like him. So then, if I can't get you to doubt God's word, the devil's going to say, I'm going to get you to doubt God's nature and his motive. 
God doesn't think, want good things for you. God wants to keep you low. He wants to keep you down. He wants to keep you ignorant. He doesn't want you to have fun. He doesn't want you to have joy. He doesn't want you to have a full life. God didn't say that to make you better. He, he said that for his own good and not for yours. That's doubting God's nature. The first temptation was to doubt God's word. The second temptation was to doubt God's nature and God's motive. And then the third temptation was to doubt God's consequence. When, he, when they realized that he couldn't get them to, to disobey God and touch the tree from those things, he said, you'll not surely die. There won't be any consequences for this. Come on, we get tempted the same way. And watch this. The thing that brought separation from God and mankind was a lack of faith and a lack of trust in God's word. Can I run that past you again? The thing that brought separation between God and man was a lack of faith and a lack of trust in God's word. But now watch this. What brings us salvation? It's faith in Jesus declared in his word. Is God not just? Is God not fair? What brings salvation is faith. Listen to what Hebrews says. Hebrews says, without faith, without trusting God, it's impossible to please God. But if I have faith and I trust him, I can please him and I can obey him and I can honor him and I'll have his blessings. It's faith. It's trust. I need to have faith in his word. I need to have faith in who he is. And I'm going to know who he is the more I read his word. Is everybody with me today? The Bible describes our origins and where pain and suffering came from. Pain and suffering in our world comes from sin and the fallen world in which we live. Number three, why do you need the Bible in your life? Why do you need God's word in your life? Because the Bible describes our human nature. It describes who we are, who I am. The Bible tells me who I am. Based on what I've observed so far, I'm a sinful human being, but I am loved by God. I'm created purposefully by God. Listen, God didn't accident. You're not an accident. God didn't create you on accident. Some of you are like, oh, but you don't know my family. You don't know my history. You don't realize, Pastor Paul, I am an accident. My mom wanted to abort me, and the abortion failed, and I survived, and here I am. I'm an accident. You are not an accident. God made that happen. I'm telling you, God has a plan for you because you are not an accident. He purposely created. Oh, pastor, you don't understand. My parents didn't want to have a baby. They were too young. They didn't have the money. They weren't done with college. Whatever, whatever, whatever. Whatever excuse you want to come up with, you think you're an accident. I will prove to you that you're not an accident. God planned you. God planned you. You're created specifically and specially for his pleasure. It's who you are. You are created by God, and you are created purposefully by God. Listen, the Bible says, how do I know that you're created on purpose? The Bible says in Acts chapter 17 that God determined the exact times and places that people should live. And he did this, look at this, the exact times and places. He did this so that people might reach out to him and find him, though he's not very far from each one of us. God chose your time. Some of you are like, well, I was born 100 years too late. I wish I'd have been a cowboy in the 1800s. Anybody like wish you could have lived in the pioneer days? Wouldn't that have been fun and kind of cool? Yeah, I was born 100 years too late. Anybody, anybody are like, man, I wish I would have lived when, when Jesus' disciples lived and I could have seen Jesus walk the earth 2,000 years ago. I wish I would have lived then at that time. Well, listen, God didn't choose you for that time. Listen, God chose you for this time. And God selected the time and the place that you would be. He selected your start, and then he gives you the opportunity to make many choices from that start. But God chose your start, and he carefully crafted you, who you are, so that you would seek him and know him and please him and love him in your life. The Bible tells me who I am. The Bible tells me why I am. I'm not an accident. I am made on purpose for God's pleasure and for his purposes. Your life can please God. God is so pleased that you're alive today. God is so pleased that you're here today. God is so pleased that you're hearing a sermon about his word today. God is so pleased that your family is with you today. There are so many things about you that God is just pleased with you. He made you for his pleasure. Even if you're a person who has rejected Jesus Christ and you're not saved, you're not a Christian, God still created you for his pleasure. 
and he's pleased for you to be alive, and he's pleased to give you good things today. God created you for his pleasure, but God also created you for his purposes, and God has a purpose for your life. God wants to use your gifts. God wants to use your talents to be a blessing to the people around you, to be a blessing to your community, for you to be a blessing to your church, for you to be a blessing to your family. God made you for some purposes, some things for you to accomplish in your life. Why am I? I exist for God's pleasure and his purpose. The Bible also tells me what I need. This, the Bible describes who I am, why I am, and what I need. Because my life is marred by sin and a struggle to trust God, did Adam and Eve have a struggle to trust God? Yeah, so do you. It's kind of fair, isn't it? I mean, I have the same struggle. Can I trust God if he asks me to do something that's absolutely impossible? If the Lord says, Paul, listen, you're going to have to get responsible and put a little bit more money in retirement, but I want you to give more to missions at the same time. Hang on, God. Anybody ever been there? Or am I alone? <laughs> it's like, can I trust him? Hey, Paul, I've got this thing I'm, I'm calling you to do, and it's not going to be easy, and you're going to have to talk all your friends into doing it with you because you can't do it alone, and it's bigger than you can ever accomplish, but this is what I'm calling you to do with your life. Will you trust me and do it? Yeah. Well, God, I can think of six ways I could ruin it. <laughs> Anybody been there? But, Lord, you said go, and you said do it, and you told me this is my call for my life. And so, God, I've got to trust you, and I've got to go. Listen, the Bible tells me what I need. And the Bible tells me that I'm a person that's marred by sin, but though I struggle to trust God through his salvation in Jesus Christ, I can trust God. I can be saved. I can please him, and I can accomplish his purpose for my life. And so can you. When you are saved and you are born again, the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of you and strengthens you so that you can win the struggle against doubting God and trust his word. Somebody say amen. amen. He will teach you how to trust his word and he'll prove himself as you trust his word over and over again. The Bible is what I need and the Bible tells me what I need. Number four, the Bible describes salvation. And this is one of the best parts of the Bible. It describes salvation. Number one, I want you to know this. God has a plan. For a fallen world and fallen people, God has a plan. The Bible is God's story, which he is creating right now in real time. He is literally creating it right now in real time. All of the Old Testament, God worked and worked and worked to create a people that would believe in one God. What was the primary problem all through the Old Testament? Well, I'll worship this God, and I'll worship this God, and I'll worship that God. I dropped my Bible. That's the worst thing. I'll worship this God, and this God, and this God, and that God. And God's like, no, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. He worked for thousands of years to create one group of people who would worship one God. And when he created those people in the fullness of time, he sent his son to those people. And the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, who was a Jew, came to the Jewish people who believed in one God. It took years of struggle. It took years of pain. It took years of suffering to work it into their hearts and their minds to prove that his word is true. But finally, he, he created a group of people who believed in one God and who could receive his one and only son and therefore go out into a world that believed in hundreds and thousands of gods and tell them that Jesus is the way. Is everybody with me today? That's what God was doing all through the Old Testament, and he was doing it in real time in history to make it happen. That's kind of a brain twister, isn't it? And then Jesus comes in the fullness of time, and he accomplishes God's salvation when he died on the cross for your sins and for my sins, and he rose from the grave to have new life and to share new life with you and me. The same power that raised Christ from the dead quickens us, strengthens us, lives in us to give us new life. 
He did it in real time. Jesus lived a real life on this earth. He died a real death, and he rose from a real grave situated just outside Jerusalem in a little place called Israel. God did it all in real time, in real history. And Jesus promised this. Listen to me, church. This is where you are. Jesus promised, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And he's still doing it today. And you're in the middle of the story. And the story's not over because the story's not finished. He's promised that he's coming again. And when he comes again, the church is going to be raptured and the dead in Christ will rise and we'll be with the Lord forever. And there's going to be a place called heaven for us to exist in forever. And the story is being written and we live in it right now. And as he builds Livestream Church, he's fulfilling his promise and he's fulfilling it in real time and he's fulfilling it through you. Your life has purpose. Your salvation has meaning. And I know it because it's in the word. And we're in the story right now. You guys with me today? Man, I'm telling you what, the, the word of God is powerful. And God has a plan. And his salvation is described to us. God sent his son so that we would have salvation. God has a plan. God sent his son. And God is pleased with faith. Let's trust him. Let's read his word. Let's learn it. And let's trust it. And lastly, understand this about God's salvation. God saves completely. God saves completely. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25 says this. Therefore, he, Jesus, is able to save completely. Everybody just say completely. He, Jesus, is able to save completely those who come to God through him. Because he, Jesus, always lives to intercede for them. The old King James version of that passage of scripture says, he saves to the uttermost. He saves completely. He saves to the uttermost, to the greatest extremity he saves. That means he saves the worst and the most unlikely. He saves the most bitter person. He saves the most angry person. He saves the person that struggles with alcohol and drug addiction. He saves the person that's arrogant and says, I don't need God. He saves the person who pushes God away and pushes God away and pushes God away. And you'll think they'll never come to church. They'll never choose Jesus. There's no way for them to ever change their mind. Listen, God saves the most unlikely people because he saves completely. Next, I want you to see this. Because he saves completely, he's generous in his salvation and you are saved completely. Sometimes people think, well, I'm saved, but God won't hear my prayer because I did this thing in the past. Did God save you and forgive you? Yeah. Then the past is in the past. Forgetting what is behind, I press on to the things that lie before me, Paul said. Old things are gone. Behold, all things are new. I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. Listen, God didn't save a little bit of me. God didn't save a part of me. God didn't save all of me except the one thing I'm most ashamed of. God saved me completely. Come on, somebody get excited and say amen about that. When you pray, you just remind yourself that you're saved completely. God didn't forgive some of you and not the rest of you. God forgave everything. You're saved completely. He is able to save completely those who come to him through Jesus Christ. Come on, he saves completely and then he saves eternally. My salvation is a complete salvation. I'm not saved for a little while. I'm saved for eternity. Praise God for his salvation that is a complete salvation to you and me. Let's stand to our feet today. I'm going to ask the musicians to come to the front. We're going to take, here's what we're going to do. Everybody listen carefully. I'm going to pick up my notes. Can I tell you what I do? Maybe the notes fell out on purpose. What's in my Bible? My Oikos list. Copy of my Oikos list. The other copies in another place. Um... I'll tell you what else is in my Bible. This is out of nowhere. This isn't my notes. I'm just going to show you something. You need the Word of God. Um, I didn't share this in the first service, but since this fell out of my Bible, I'm going to share it, and I think it's okay. About two months ago, while I was at work, I had this weird episode. I was telling Jeff about it right before church today. I had this weird episode where I began to break out in a cold sweat. I got faint. I started losing my vision in my right eye. I was like, what is going on with me? I laid on the floor, and uh, I was afraid I was going to have to call an ambulance and take the first ambulance ride in my life. I was not looking forward to that, right? And uh, after that, you know, uh, I called the doctor's office and said, what do you think? And they're like, oh, you need to come in. That vision thing, there's something really bad. The doctor looked at me, asked me a few questions. He uh, checked me out. Turned out um, I probably had a low blood sugar 
situation going on and I was dehydrated. They went to draw blood and the lady couldn't get any blood to come out of my vein. I don't know if anybody's ever been dehydrated before. So, you know, when they pull the, when they pull the big needle out of your vein, you're supposed to bleed, right? She pulled, that, she pulled the needle out of my vein. She didn't put a Band-Aid on it. She didn't apply pressure. She didn't, nothing. She just pulled it out and knew. She's like, I'm not a doctor, but you're dehydrated. You won't even bleed. And I just put a big hole in your vein. You need to go home and drink a gallon of water. Well, in the midst of all that, my doctor calls me back and he's like, hey, we're going to do an MRI. We got to find out what's going on with that vision thing. That's not right. So they did an MRI. And then they, then they said, we got to send you to a neurologist. You might have MS. That means my brain's going to quit working. <laughs> like, hey, God, I'd like to have my brain. You know what I'm saying? And so after getting that phone call, I just cut and pasted these scriptures into this little piece of paper. And I put it in my Bible. And I put it in my other Bible. And I put it in, my, I put it in four Bibles that I generally would read from. Or utilize. And I had Jeremiah 30, I will restore you to health and heal your wounds. Matthew 8, it was spoken through the prophet Isaiah, he took up our infirmities and bore our diseases. Psalm 103, praise the Lord on my soul, forget not all his benefits, who forgives all my sins and heals all my diseases and saves my life from destruction. Put that in your Bible. Psalm 91, he will call on me and I will answer him. He'll be with me in trouble and I'll deliver him and honor him. And with long life, I'll satisfy him. Man, when I face something like that, I just, I get my scriptures. I put them on a piece of paper like this, and I put them in my Bible, and I'm going to read them. I'm going to remind myself of them. I'm going to tell myself over and over again, listen, you need the Word of God in your life for all the reasons that we mentioned today, Amen. because God has salvation for you. God has salvation for you. And you know what? We gain it. We understand it. We live in it. It becomes richer and richer as we understand his word. Read it. Learn it. Study it. Memorize it. Hide it in your heart. Here's what I want us to do today. We're going to take just a little bit of time to sing a song. And I'm going to have them play it just a little bit softly. But in the next few moments, we're going to respond to God. And I want you to take time to pray and ask God what he wants you to do about reading the Bible, about studying the Bible. And the Lord may speak to you about a way to read the Bible, uh, something that you need to engage in. I'll tell you what I do. I have, I have the Bible on, it, on an app. I use version on my phone. Listen, there's a lot of people doing stuff on their phones. They'll send them straight to hell. But I'm going to use my phone and redeem it and fill my mind with the Word of God because it's available. And some of you say, well, I'm not a good reader, Pastor Paul. You don't have to be a good reader. Man, sometimes I just... And reverence of your lives. Your beauty should not come sometimes I just need to listen to the Word. Such as elaborate hairstyles and wearing of them. You can listen to the Word if you're not a good reader. Consume it. Eat the Word. Take it in. Get it in your heart. Get it in your mind. Whether you have to read it, sit down with your spouse and read it to each other. Whatever it takes, get in the Word of God. And find some information from the Holy Spirit about how you're to do that. Let the Lord rearrange your schedule so that you'll read the Word. Let the Lord make new habits in your life so you'll read the Word. Let the Lord create a new habit in your household so that you and your children read the Word together. I'm glad to say that in the course of the years that my kids grew up in my house, I read the entire Bible to them. And you can do the same thing with your kids. Just start reading the Bible together. The Word of God is powerful. So let's listen to the Holy Spirit for the next few moments and let's receive His Word. Can we do that? Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Father, in the next few seconds, do powerful things in this room. God, you've given us a plan of salvation through your Word and we want to receive all of it today. Lord, to please you, to honor you, and to have blessing in our life. Lord, would you accomplish it, we pray. Now, maybe you're here in the room and you say, I want to choose Jesus as my Savior. I want to know that my sins are forgiven. I want to know that I'm on my way to heaven. I need to do that today. And Pastor Paul, I want you to pray with me right now. I want you to pray with me right now that my sins will be forgiven. I'll be on my way to heaven. If that's you, hold your hand up and look at me. And I'm going to pray with everybody, but I'm going to pray with, pray with you right now. I want to choose Jesus as my Savior. I want to know I'm right with God before I walk out of this room today. Anybody? 
Anybody else? Here's what I want us to do. Everybody pray this prayer together with me today, and we're going to prepare our hearts for communion, and I want you to listen for the voice of the Holy Spirit giving you direction on how to get into His Word today. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, I know I've sinned, and I need your forgiveness, and I believe that you love me, and you sent Jesus to die on the cross in my place. In Jesus' name, Father God, forgive me and remove all my sin. Make me new. Make me clean. Put your Holy Spirit in my life so that I can know you more and I can live for you with your strength. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now, as the worship team sings this song, I'm going to challenge you to just take a few moments. You can sit down. You can stand up. Whatever you need to do, just take a few minutes. I want you to relax in the presence of God. I want you to think about God's Word and what His instructions might be for you. Next, some God's instructions for me. He said, I, I know that I'm supposed to read this Bible completely every year of my life. Last year, I read it twice on top of all my doctoral reading on top of all my sermon preparation. It is not sermon preparation reading, it's Bible reading, right? This year, I'm gonna read the Bible twice. Uh, last year, I read it one time through in the NIV, one time through in the New Living Translation. A couple years ago, I read it in the New King James Version. I literally, in December, I'm like, God, show me how to read my Bible next year. And I just let the Holy Spirit drop thoughts into my mind. I think about it logically, I make a plan, and this is how I'm gonna read the, God's Word. I've got a group of 35 to 40 men that read the Bible with me every morning. One of my Bible reading times through this year is with my group of friends on YouVersion. If you're a man at Livestream Church, befriend me on YouVersion and I'll invite you to write, read the Bible with us. It's that simple. I just invited Jack Haskell just recently and he joined our crew midway through the year. You can join our crew and read with us. And it's a joy to read the Bible together, isn't it, Gary? I mean, there's a bunch of guys in this room that are doing this with me. And so, I mean, just think about it. Like, God, how am I going to do that? Let me give you another one. I'm, it's, I'm going a little too long, but let me, I'm trying to get creative ideas so the Holy Spirit will speak to you, okay? You don't have to do what I have to do. In 1997, the Lord spoke to me and said, read the Bible as many times as you are years alive. When you're 27, or how old was I then? 26, 27 years old, I'm a little behind, Right? I got a lot of catching up to do. I plan on accomplishing it by the time I'm 69. I have a plan. And I'm trying to work my way through that plan. Hey, if I don't, if, what if I don't make the plan? It doesn't matter to me. What matters is that I did what God told me to do. He set the goal and I said, okay. That's what matters, right? And in the process, man, I have learned so much about God reading his word, sometimes two or three times in the course of a year. I challenge you, read the Bible. Uh, there's a small group, Jeff Nowd and Maggie. Maggie's playing piano, Jeff's right here. Their small group this fall, some of you, the Holy Spirit will speak to you. You need to get in a small group so you study the word with some other friends. That's what you need. You need some friends around you. Their small group this fall, they've had a small group for a couple years, but their small group this fall is going to go through the Bible in a 24-month process and read the entire Bible in 24 months because there's some people in the group that haven't read the whole Bible yet. Hey, isn't that a great plan? Let the Holy Spirit give you some thoughts and plans like that. And he may give you some things that aren't anything that I said. That's between you and God. But can we just take some quiet moment and just relax before the Lord, hear what he has to say, be refreshed as his Holy Spirit drops thoughts and, and creative ideas into your mind so that you'll get in the word. Amen. Let's seek him today. <laughs>